The most effective preventative measure in stopping the spread of zebra and quagga mussels is to intercept infected watercraft and decontaminate them before they can launch and infect other water bodies. In a few moments, we're going to be going outside and walking you through the inspection and decontamination of watercraft. But before we do that, we're going to take a few moments and show you some of the tools that will help you conduct a thorough inspection. One of the first things that you should have when conducting watercraft inspections is a watercraft inspection form. This form allows you to record the pertinent information for tracking the vessel, and it also serves as a checklist for when you're inspecting the various parts of the watercraft. As you inspect the part of the watercraft, check it off your list, thus ensure you're not going to miss any of those key components. An extendable inspection mirror will help you get in and see some of those areas that you might not be able to physically get down and get a good clear view of. A magnifying glass. This will help you differentiate between organic road grit or other organic debris that's on the boat and small juvenile mussels. This will let you magnify and see the difference between the two. A flashlight. A lot of the areas on watercraft such as bilges, through hull fittings or other areas are very dark. This will allow you to illuminate those areas and get a clear view. And finally, much like the inspection mirror, a digital camera can be used for those areas that you can't get in physically and, and visually inspect. You can use the camera to insert it into those areas, take a picture, and come back and utilize the viewfinder to, to inspect that. Likewise, the camera can be used for documenting on those vessels where the mussels are and then use that for in the decontamination part. These tools will help you do a thorough systematic inspection. Now let's head outside and utilize these and work through an inspection. Now we're gonna go in and do an actual inspection on the vessel. Like we talked about earlier, make sure that you come in with a game plan and that you do your inspection in a systematic and methodical fashion. We're gonna start on the exterior of the boat, the hull, and we're gonna work our way from the bow to the stern. Make sure that you cover both sides of the boat, both the starboard and the port side. And when you're doing the inspection, you're gonna do it both visually and tactily. Meaning you're gonna take, and while you're visually inspecting, make sure that you're also touching the hull with your, with your hand and you're rubbing, because you're feeling for the muscles you're not only feeling for the adults, but you could be feeling for the juvenile villagers and they'll feel like sandpaper on it. So you're gonna start up in and make sure that you're concentrating. You're gonna find where the water line is on the boat. And you can see by the bottom paint. And I like to concentrate, take about the, bot the water line, go up about six inches and then work my way down. And you're gonna work your way along the hull and you're looking, you're paying attention to the chine areas and you're feeling along the back of them. When you get down, you're going to see on the bottom paint, bottom paint is actually a coating that they've painted onto the boat, and it's supposed to inhibit uh, organisms from attaching to it. But mussels readily attach to it. Also, bottom paint can easily be rubbed off on a boat when uh, boat contacts with the bottom. And if it scrapes off, it makes a rough area, and the mussels will easily attach to there. So make sure that you're feeling. You can see we have mussels down here all along the bottom, right at the, right at the keel. And along the back side of these chine areas, make sure that you're feeling with your hands. And you're gonna come out and you'll be able to feel the muscles. Another area that you need to look at that's kind of hard to, to inspect on, on vessels that are on trailers is where the boat's resting on the bunks. Make sure that you're looking right up along the edge of the bunk and that you're also feeling your hand right along the edge where that bunk contacts the hull. Work your way again from the bow to the stern. You're visually inspecting the boat all the way and tactile, you're feeling it. One important thing to note when you're doing the, the hull of a boat, lots of times you're gonna have to get dirty and you're actually gonna have to get down and get under the boat because again, like, we were look, like I was showing you, you can inspect this one side of the bunk on the trailer, but you can't visually in, uh, see from the other side. 
So you're going to have to actually get down and get under the trailer so you can look along this far edge of the bunk all the way down the back. Also, while you're under the boat here checking the, checking the underside of the hull, this is a perfect opportunity to be looking, visually checking for through hull fittings. While this boat here doesn't have any, a lot of larger boats will have through hull fittings where they're drawing water up for their cooling systems and various things for the engine, maybe air conditioning, uh, fresh water drawing. And those are spots where you have to get under here and visually check. Muscles like to get up into those through hulls. Muscles really like the areas that are dark, shaded, and protected. So this is a great time to be looking for those spots while you're under here. On these cross members on the trailers, like we were talking about, if the drain hole is plugged and you know that there's water in here, we're going to have to get in and somehow decontaminate it. And that'll mean flushing it with hot water. Along the top of these cross members or on the ends, there's usually holes that you can access and you can flush the hot water into these to make sure that you're adequately getting it hot enough to kill any villagers that may be in that raw water that's in there. One thing to remember when you're inspecting the lower unit and gimbal areas on watercraft is that the outdrives can move side to side or up and down. And if you make sure that you can, can manipulate them, that'll give you clearer view in some of these areas. There's a lot of parts back in there moving it from one side to the other will open it up so you can get a clear vision in there. Now we're going to inspect the lower unit and gimbal area on this watercraft. Again, keep the theme of be, having a game plan, be systematic and methodical. How I like to approach it is to work from the bottom up, from point A all the way through what I consider point Z. So we'll start here. We're going to start looking at the skeg on the out, out drive. You can see we have muscles all along the bottom here right up around here where there's the angle, there's muscles. We're going to work our way up the lower unit and we're going to come to the water intake. These are the cooling intakes for the engines. Muscles really like to get in here. Water will be drawn up in there. One thing to remember about it is that you not only want to look at them straight on, but you want to get at an angle so you can look back in. And you'll often see muscles in there. Make sure that you pay attention to the hub and the prop. You'll have muscles that'll be on the angles of the prop. Also get up and look down into the prop. Work your way up, see along the cavitation plate, lots of right angles in here. Then there's the bolt heads where the lower unit bolts onto the gimbal area. You want to get in here and you want to reach. You see we have muscles all, all attached along there. Again, work your way up. The hydraulic rams which raise and lower the unit Again, you're going to get in, there's lots of angles, hydraulic hoses, muscles all along there. Work your way right up to the top of the gimbal unit and look back in here again. This is where we were talking about being able to move the, the lower unit from side to side. This is where some of that equipment we talked about, like the flashlights, will come in handy. Also, you can use your inspection mirror. There's some spots in here that's really tough to get your head back under. Utilize your inspection mirror. Also, you're feeling tactically. These hoses, hydraulic hoses, run your hands along them. Again, often you'll feel the muscles and you can scrape them off. This boat has been taken directly out of Lake Mead, which is infested with quagga mussels. And that's why it's heavily encrusted with the mussels themselves. A lot of time, the vessels that you're inspecting are not readily identifiable from an infested water body or they'll be clean. So that's where this, the feeling with, the, with your tactile senses comes very into play. A lot of times you're not going to see anything, you're simply going to be feeling and all of a sudden you're going to come along and you're going to feel those, those bumps which are those settled uh, muscles. When you're inspecting the transom of boats, Transoms comes in all different shapes and sizes and have varying parts of equipment that are hanging from them. This particular boat doesn't have much from it, but a lot of boats will have trim tabs. They'll be in this, this area of the boat, providing the stabilization for it. You want to inspect the trim tabs. They have hydraulic rams, they have hinges, they have plates. Make sure that you're doing exactly like we do on an outdrive. You're looking at them visually and tactically ins inspecting them. On the back of boats, they'll also have things such as transducers for the depth finders. 
speed indicators, pitot tubes. All those have hoses, they have bolts, attachment points. Make sure that you're inspecting all around them. You're looking under, to the side, everything on them. You also want to pay attention on boats to drain plugs. This particular boat has a drain plug in the back. Muscles will attach all along the drain plugs and also the drain plugs are what could contain raw water inside the bilge. So you want to make sure that you're checking those, opening them up, seeing if there's any water in the boat. Now that we've inspected the exterior of the boat, it's time to move in and inspect the interior. There's things such as bilges, live wells, anchor holds, all types of wet storage that we need to check. Those things can harbor raw water, hence they can harbor the villagers. So one of the first things that we're going to check on this boat is the bilge compartment. Now inspecting the bilge compartment, this is another spot that you may use some of those tools such as the flashlight. You want to make sure that you're looking down and seeing if there's any standing water in there. Now that we've inspected the bilge, we'll move on to some of those other holds that I've, I've mentioned. This is a typical wet hold that you'll find in lots of these boats. You know this is a wet hold because number one, they're lined with plastic and like this one, it has a drain plug in it. So any water will drain out of it and go into the, into the bilge. But if you notice, the drain plug is up slightly on it. So this could still contain standing water. So you want to make sure that you're inspecting these. Here's another example of a type of wet hold that you may encounter. This is a, uh, a hold where they'll put various implements in it. A lot of it on these pleasure craft will have water skis or life jackets in it. And you need to inspect these because these holds can contain water or a lot of this equipment, if they put it away wet, will maintain wet and villagers can be in it. So this is, this is another area that you want to take a, a good look at. You'll also notice in here that we actually have a drain plug. And this is another hold that could drain back into the bilge. And we have standing water in here. So this will have to be removed or decontaminated. Be sure to take into consideration when you're checking these boats that things such as PFDs, water ski ropes, floatable toys, a lot of implements that folks use when they're out recreating are, are absorbent and they can take up lake water that could harbor villagers. So these things, if they maintain their moisture, you could have villagers in it. If somehow an adult mussel got scraped off and got into this hold and then they packed the wet materials over the top of it, you still have an environment where that mussel could survive. So you want to take that into consideration and if we need to do a decontamination, we not only decontaminate the boat, but we also decontaminate this type of equipment as well with the hot water to kill the mussels. Other things that you need to make sure that you inspect in watercraft, fenders. Boat owners will rig these so they'll actually be down into the water and after a certain amount of time, mussels will attach to them. When they bring these inside the, inside the vessel, store them in a compartment, they maintain their moisture. Mussels can live on these for long periods of time. Make sure you take into consideration to check the fenders. When inspecting watercraft, make sure that you also look for the anchor and the anchor line. Anchors are particularly troublesome. When they're dropped down to the bottom, they can actually snag clusters of adult mussels. Those mussels can hook on here and maintain. They're brought in the boat, they're put down into the anchor locker, the moisture is maintained in there, and those mussels can remain viable for long periods of time. Make sure that you inspect these. Realize that the watercraft that we just finished the inspection on is a pretty simple watercraft, but it's representative of lots of the types that are out there but realize watercraft come in all shapes and sizes, from 50-foot houseboats down to 
eight or nine foot car top Lakers. Just make sure that you do the same type of inspection on all of them. Work your way through it, be very methodical, systematic. On the large boats, realize that there's probably some extra systems that you should look into, such as the marine heads, cooling systems, things like that. Again, while they may appear complex, all you have to do is work through them in a systematic fashion and you'll get through the inspection fine. Now let's go on to decontaminations. We're also going to cover some equipment that will help you through the decontamination and keep you safe while doing it. Since you are using high pressure hot water, it's very advisable to have a good quality rain gear with eye protection. Also, should have a good pair of heavy duty heat resistant gloves. 140 degree water can burn skin readily. And since you're gonna be moving up and down and kneeling a lot, it's advisable to have a good pair of knee pads. Prior to doing the actual hot water wash, one thing that we also recommend is to get a plastic scraper and some lightweight gloves. What you can do is prior to doing the hot water wash, you can actually take and scrape the adult muscles and some of the biomass off of the boat, collect it. Also, we advise that you use a plastic scraper. These can be at any hardware store or paint store. If they come with fairly sharp edges, it's advisable to take and maybe round those edges off with a little sandpaper and a little file so you don't do damage on the, on the finish of the boat. Also, why we say on the gloves, put these gloves on and if you have um, such as hydraulic rams or rounded fittings, you can actually just take and rub the muscles off. Simply grab onto the, to the piece of rounded equipment and you can scrape the muscles off with your hands. You should also, to check your pressure washer when you're doing the decontamination, it's advisable to have a thermometer. These infrared thermometers work great that way you can monitor what the temperature of the water is as it exits the wand. Again, the key is 140 degrees. One thing you need to note, as that water leaves the end of the wand, the farther it goes away, the more the temperature drops. So it's advisable to have these so you know the optimal range for that wand to be away from the boat to maintain that temperature rating. Some other things you can get, various types of brushes such as bottle brushes. These will let you get in around the gimbal unit and some of those hard to, hard to reach areas. Get in there and you can rub the muscles off with that. Now we're gonna cover some of the specialized uh, equipment that's out available. And this is just a, a, a demonstration of, of some things that are on the market. This is a diffuser unit. Plug this into your hot water wand and instead of shooting 2,000 to 3,000 pounds per square inch, it takes it down to a nice flow, almost like out of a garden hose. And that way you can flush around the gimbal unit without damaging any of the hoses that that high, water, high pressure water would do. This is an earmuff flushing unit. This is for attaching onto the lower unit and it allows you to flush the cooling system of the watercraft as muscles can get up inside there. This lets you flush the cooling system. Likewise, on some larger vessels, there's through hull fittings that are on the underside of the watercraft on the hull. This is what they call a faker laker. And uh, what it is, again, you attach the, the, your um, hose to it, put it up so it seals around the through hull, and you can pump water up into those fittings. We'll also cover the high pressure wand that you'll use Make sure when you're using the high pressure wand that you're using one of the higher degree nozzles. This is a 40 degree nozzle. That way it spreads the pressure out and you won't do any damage to the finish of the boat. This is also another specialized unit. This is called a turbo nozzle and you attach a long wand on it and this allows you to work underneath the boat and spray up and knock the muscles off of the hull. And last but not least, you obviously use the trigger, trigger mechanism and the, the gun for working your unit. So this is just a little bit of the equipment that, that uh, you can use and uh, now we'll show it to you in action. Decontamination units come in a variety of sizes and configurations. 
They can range in size from small portable units costing around $2,500 up to large, fully self-contained drive-on units capable of decontaminating more than one watercraft at a time and costing upwards of $250,000. The washer unit shown here is an example of a top-of-the-line, fully self-contained drive-on unit and it is in use at Lake Mead. The portable washer shown here is one that we will be using in this video to demonstrate how to decontaminate watercraft and it is typical of a middle of the line portable unit. Wastewater and solids from the decontamination process should be contained so that they can be properly disposed of in accordance with local regulations. The pad shown here has inflatable sides to retain the wastewater and solids from the decontamination process so they can be contained and properly disposed of. This type of system is typical of these used with portable decontamination units and is available commercially. When watercraft are heavily encrusted with mussels, the decontamination process can be greatly accelerated by using a plastic scraper like the one shown here to remove the bulk of the mussels before using the power washer. When using the power washer to kill and remove attached mussels from exterior surfaces, Move the wand slowly across the treatment area so that all surfaces receive the 140 degree treatment for at least 5 to 10 seconds depending on the species of mussels found. Recent research had determined that 5 second exposure to 140 degree temperatures will kill 100% of quagga mussels, but 10 second exposure time is required to kill the thicker shelled zebra mussels. Here you are seeing the turbo nozzle being used to clean the underside of the watercraft and trailer. This is an example of using the variety of attachments available to treat hard to reach areas of the watercraft. There are areas on watercraft that can be damaged by using high pressure nozzles. Here you see a diffuser attachment being used to flush the gimbal area where the rubber boots and gaskets could be damaged by the high pressure spray. The diffuser unit kills muscles but typically does not remove them. You can use small brushes to get rid of mussels that were killed by the hot water flush but remained attached. The attachment seen here is an adaptation of the standard earmuffs used to flush outboard cooling systems. Attach the earmuffs, connect the hot water hose, and once you have hot water flowing at 140 degrees, start and run the engine for 90 seconds to kill any mussels that may be found in the engine cooling system. Because of the high water temperatures, Remember to wear rain gear, heavy gloves, and safety glasses when doing any decontamination. The diffuser attachment can also be used to treat the bunks and hollow frame members on watercraft trailers. On the inside of the watercraft, remove the engine hatch and check for standing water. If any water is found, drain as thoroughly as possible and then use the diffuser attachment to thoroughly flush the area for at least two to three minutes. Repeat this same process for flushing live wells, fish wells, and any storage compartments that can contain raw water. Be sure to inspect any onboard storage compartments. Remember that anchor lines, PFDs, fenders, and other equipment can harbor mussels and villagers. If any moisture is found in any storage compartment, remove the contents, place them on the containment mat, and thoroughly rinse with 140 degree water to kill any small mussels or villagers that may be present. You should check the water temperature of your unit frequently to ensure that a temperature of 140 degrees is maintained at the point of contact. Remember that water can cool as much as 15 to 20 degrees per foot of distance. A remote temperature sensor like the one seen here works best for this application because the high water temperature can pose a safety risk to the operator. When you're doing inspections, like we said, you'll come into a contact with a large variety of watercraft and one of special consideration are competition water ski or wakeboard boats. As these now have specialized ballast tanks in them that can hold raw water. Some of the things that you need to look for that may key in that a boat may have these ballast tanks are multiple through hole fittings both to the stern and to the forward portion of the boat. This gives you an indication that there may be some tanks in this boat. Another one, an obvious one, is a, wa a wakeboard rack. Again, generally wakeboarders like to have a boat that's going to throw a big wake so they can do jumps and aerials. And to do that, they want to have a boat that's weighted down, hence why they put ballast water in these things. 
So we're also gonna take a look in the engine compartment and I'm gonna show you some specialized plumbing that shows how this water is coming up into these tanks. And these tanks are not always obvious when you're looking. So we'll go to the back and take a look at that. When you start to look in down at the bilge area, you notice there's extra piping here. Here we have four sets of tubes and elbow jo joints. That's a good indicator that there's extra ballast tanks inside of Autocraft. The problem with these boats that have the specialized ballast tanks in them is there's really no effective way to get in and, and inspect them. They're an enclosed system, they're usually encased in fiberglass, you can't see into them. So the safest thing to do is do a decontamination on them. First step is you want to make sure that they are drained to the greatest extent possible and then you're going to fill these with the hot water. Now one thing to remember though, when we talk about the 140 degrees, that will actually damage the uh, impellers on the pumps that, that fill these tanks. So what you're actually shooting for is you're shooting for a temperature range that is between the 104 to 130 degree maximum. To do that, you can get a specialized attachment for the wand for your hot water pressure washer that acts as a diffuser and a coolant. You simply attach it in, feed it in through one of the through hull fittings that's going into the tank and you pump the water in. You're going to want to do this before decontaminating the rest of the boat. Because of the lower temperature, you're going to want to increase the contact time. So you'll do this before you do any of the washing on the other side of the boat. Make sure that this water stays in the tanks long enough to kill any mussels and any villagers that may be in there with that water. You've just been shown how to properly inspect and decontaminate watercraft. And while you've seen a variety of tools and equipment used, realize that the volume of watercraft to be processed and the manpower and budgets of your particular programs will dictate exactly the type of equipment and tools that you do use. Regardless of this, the objective remains the same, to intercept infected watercraft and thoroughly decontaminate them. And this means killing and removing any attached muscles or any onboard villagers. Thank you, and please remember, don't move a muscle.